Yeah. Okay. And and uh, we'll give like a minute. We'll start at around seven thirty one or seven thirty two. Okay, um, so Andrew, I think we can um, get started at Dr. Stadnik's having trouble getting into her computer, so um, I'm sure she'll join us shortly, uh, but I can introduce um, um, uh, Lawrence. Okay, you're live. Two, Good, morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, one of our residents, uh, Lawrence Slau, who will be presenting today on endocarditis. It takes a team. Um, as we know that this has, uh, um, endocarditis has been uh, around for a long time, uh, but lately we've uh, developed strategies to address this uh, with a team-based approach, and Lawrence has been a big part of uh, enabling this, so we look forward to his presentation. Lawrence, take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Beanlines, and good morning, everyone. Um, so I'll be presenting on also on behalf of the endocarditis team. Um, so I know many of uh, them are online as well um, and hopefully can offer uh, comments um, as well. So despite um, the ongoing advances in many fields of cardiology, uh, the mortality in endocarditis has remained um, actually alarmingly high at around 20% and has held, held steady around there uh, for the past two decades. Uh, in Canada, the absolute number of deaths directly attributable to infective endocarditis um, continues to rise, uh, reaching nearly 900 deaths um, in 2019. Um, for comparison, uh, this is all from Statistics Canada. Um, these are deaths from uh, PEs, uh, MR, as well as HCM. Similarly, in Ontario, the incidence of infective endocarditis is, is steadily rising, especially in high and moderate risk populations, um, as in those with predisposing uh, cardiac factors. Part of the challenge with endocarditis is that over the past several decades, um, there has been a gradual shift in the patient population without really a substantial change in the way we fundamentally treat these patients, that is with uh, antibiotics and surgery when indicated. Um, today, although we still see patients with traditionally predisposing risk factors such as congenital heart disease or prior endocarditis, um, we're seeing a lot more patients who come in with IV substance use um, as well as patients who are older, perhaps with more comorbidities, 
um, including end-stage renal disease and cancer requiring indwelling uh, catheters, um, as well as patients with prosthetic valves and implantable devices. Um, the cornerstone of diagnosis is um, uh, very much rooted in echocardiography, but within the past 10 years or so, there's been growing use and expertise, including local expertise here at the Heart Institute uh, in multimodality imaging um, and the use of FDG PET in endocarditis. Um, although treatment, uh, of course, is uh, uh, rooted in antibiotic therapy and surgery, um, there is recognition that the optimal timing of surgery requires careful consideration of the risks and benefits um, of awaiting convalescence. Um, so in particular, the risk of embolization needs to be weighed against the risk of having early surgery, um, which is associated with recurrence as well as um, paraprosthetic leaks. Additionally, we've learned um, through the POET trial recently that oral antibiotic therapy in highly selected in, um, patients may be an option. Um, and lastly, prevention is probably one of the most critical and often overlooked aspects of the care of the endocarditis patient, which traditionally has focused on antibiotic prophylaxis um, for procedures in high-risk individuals. But nowadays, um, we should also uh, carefully consider um, treatment of substance use disorders um, uh, to ensure durable remission from endocarditis. Um, so for the rest of this talk, I wanted to highlight some aspects of diagnosis and management um, that have been recurring themes on discussion in our weekly endocarditis team meetings. Um, specifically, I wanted to review the role of FDG PET in endocarditis, which has become much more routine in clinical practice um, and, of course, which we're fortunate to have expertise in. Um, second, I'll review evidence in endocarditis associated with a very complex, um, sort of difficult population, um, which is endocarditis with, um, associated with people who inject drugs. And then lastly, I'm going to review some of our experience with our own endocarditis team, as well as um, some data that uh, I've gathered uh, in the past year. So first I'll review the role of FDG PET. Um, so the cardiologist um, plays the lead role in the diagnosis of endocarditis, or one of the lead roles in the diagnosis of endocarditis um, as an imaging specialist. Um, of course, the clinical presentation um, as well as microbiology are ex extremely important, um, but the cardiologist must decide when and how to use each of these imaging modalities. Um, so in general, in endocarditis, I think of there being three primary imaging modalities, each with its own purpose. Um, I would say that echo is the powerhouse having superior temporal resolution um, and defines valvular hemodynamics, ventricular function, as well as vegetation behavior. Um, it is very important to perform TEE early when there is a suspicion of endocarditis, um, as well as repeat TEEs if ever you're unsure that the of the diagnosis or in patients um, who are being managed conservatively. Um, in the other corner, we have CT, which offers the best spatial um, resolution, um, which can be helpful in ruling out structural complications, especially when prosthetic material obscures echo assessment. And then last but not least, in the third corner, we have FDG PET, um, which offers what I call functional resolution um, in that it provides adjunctive data about the metabolic status um, with the presence and degree of inflammation of infection. Um, so you can kind of appreciate how these three modalities are very complementary to one another. As we know, the diagnosis of endocarditis is based on the modified DO criteria, which lists two major criteria, one of which are echo criteria um, listed here. Uh, the ESC um, has actually included uh, or further modified these criteria to include uh, evidence of abnormal activity around the site of a prosthetic valve implantation detected on PET um, or radio labeled leukocyte SPECT, CT. Um, in the former, only if pros the prosthesis was implanted within, uh, or sorry, after three months. Um, it also includes, um, as one of the criterion, definite paravalvular lesions by cardiac CT. Um, several studies have shown that PET can reclassify up to 90% of uh, suspected or possible endocarditis 
uh, or prosthetic valve endocarditis um, and has been increasingly used in equivalent cases uh, around the world, including in our center. Just as a review, FDG-PET relies on the overexpression of glucose uptake transporters on the surface of inflammatory cells, um, such as GLUT1, uh, which are abundant at sites of um, uh, inflammation and infection. FDG is phosphorylated by hexokinase into FDG6 phosphate, which is trapped in the cell and can be detected by PET imaging. A study from Brazil uh, in Sao Paulo um, actually correlated findings on PET directly with histopathological features in patients with both prosthetic and native valve endocarditis. Um, they showed that um, PET positive patients, so in orange here, uh, were more likely to have um, more fibrin, uh, more PMNs and inflammatory cells, um, whereas PET negative patients tended to have less of that and more fibrosis on pathology. Um, a team at the Heart Institute, uh, which included uh, Drs. Juno, Chow, and, and Dr. Beanlands, um, published a, a great systematic review and meta-analysis that included um, seven studies looking at PET and endocarditis. Uh, in their study, um, prosthetic valve endocarditis comprised the bulk of the population um, included in these trials. And based on their analysis, they found that the pooled sensitivity was 81% and specificity was 85%. Um, with a very good accuracy as well. Um, a very similar meta-analysis done a couple of years later, which included um, a few more contemporary studies, um, showed basically the same results um, as you can see here. Um, interestingly, they found that the pooled sensitivities and specificities for studies done after 2015 were actually higher when compared to, to those uh, done before that year. Um, likely reflecting advances in FDG PET over that time period. There's also evidence that uh, PET has prognostic value in endocarditis. Um, so this is data from a prospective study from La Tabune Hospital in France. They undertook PET in prosthetic valve endocarditis patients and then followed them for occurrence of clinical events for about a year afterwards. Um, and ultimately, they found that the presence of FDG PET um, uptake, so PET positive here in, uh, in red, nearly doubled the risk uh, of a primary composite endpoint of death, uh, acute heart failure, endocarditis recurrence, rehospitalization, um, and new embolic events um, compared to patients who were PET negative. Furthermore, they found that PET independently predicts the occurrence of new embolism in patients who are already on appropriate antibiotics. Uh, so patients with a negative or low um, uptake FDG PET, seen here in the dashed uh, lines here on this Kaplan-Meier curve, were less likely to have uh, an embolic event at 40 days compared with patients with a high uptake or positive PET. Um, so this is a very, I think, a, an important endpoint uh, because embolic events are often very difficult to predict and can lead to significant um, mortality and morbidity, um, including stroke and, um, and hemorrhage. Um, and so PET can be seen as a, um, uh, to have additional value um, to risk stratify patients who may benefit from earlier surgery. Um, so you might wonder if there's any such role um, in native valve endocarditis, um, especially if a TEE is equivocal or contraindicated in a patient. Uh, but unfortunately, um, while uh, FDG PET has very good specificity in this population, it has very poor sensitivity um, of only 31%. Um, this is data from the, the same meta-analysis uh, from Cleveland Clinic. Um, in addition to that, there are other cautions and factors to consider when interpreting the results of PET and endocarditis uh, in prosthetic valve endocarditis. Um, first of all, um, as we know, FDG PET requires strict adherence to a low carb diet for 12 hours, followed by fasting for 12 hours, and then sometimes by administration of heparin, all in an effort to adequately suppress um, FDG uptake in normal myocardium. When preparation is inadequate, 
um, you can get false positive results or uninterpretable results, um, as we see here in the top panels. Um, with adequate preparation, you know, it reveals that um, there is in fact um, uh, endocarditis around a prosthetic aortic valve here. After surgical prosthetic valve implantation, um, mild to moderate um, uptake is sometimes seen as a normal variant as well, um, possibly related to a, mo a mild foreign body reaction or strain on the aortic wall. Um, these are all images uh, of a bileaflet mechanical valve. Um, the first uh, images here demonstrate no uptake at all, um, which is normal. Um, in the middle panels, um, there is intense uptake uh, as seen in endocarditis. And then in the third panel, um, this is a normal variant in a patient who uh, was later followed up and determined not to have evidence of endocarditis clinically. Similarly, mild FDG uptake can be seen uh, at the struts of, a, uh, of bioprosthetic valves, um, which is seen here, um, which is also a normal variant. Um, these images are from various patients showing uptake due to surgical adhesive, such as bioglue. Um, surgical adhesive is very well known to be very FDG avid, which has been described in many case series um, uh, in the heart as well as for other various organs. Um, this FDG uptake can actually persist for many years, if not indefinitely. So it's important that um, uh, clinicians and uh, reading radiologists know that um, about the use of bioglue prior to interpre uh, interpreting these studies. Um, of course, um, one must be mindful of the fact that there are other cardiac pathologies um, that are uh, also FDG avid, such as uh, in cardiac sarcoidosis. Um, so here is uptake along the basal septum in a patient with cardiac sarcoid. Um, although good for infections involving the prosthetic valves themselves, um, so often involving the sewing ring first, um, PET will often miss actual vegetations that are located on prosthetic valves. Um, so here arrows point to um, uh, vegetations uh, actually on the prosthetic valve seen on CT um, without corresponding uptake on the PET. Um, so similar to a native valve endocarditis, um, PET uptake may be low in actual vegetations themselves because of just the small size of veg vegetation, um, the fact that they're quite mobile or um, tend to be av avascular. Um, Importantly, PET is also less sensitive when there are low levels of systemic inflammation, uh, as in when uh, the CRP is not markedly elevated. Um, so this is a PET from a patient with uh, pathologically confirmed endocardial endocarditis um, of a prosthetic aortic valve uh, who had a CRP of 14 after completing antibiotic therapy, but then five days later had new septic emboli with evidence of vegetation on echo um, and who, who then required early redo surgery. A Dutch study from 2018 tried to address some of these uncertainties. Um, they enrolled patients who had prosthetic valves uh, and underwent PET for either endocarditis or cancer surveillance. Um, they found that most false negative PETs were, uh, were in patients with overall low levels of inflammation, so less CRP less than 40, um, as well as patients with prior use of surgical adhesives. So by removing these patients, um, they were able to improve sensitivity to 100% and specificity to 91% um, and accuracy in their, uh, uh, these patients um, and PET in these patients was excellent. Um, so as mentioned earlier, the 2015 ESC guidelines in, on endocarditis suggest avoiding uh, PET if um, the prosthesis was implanted uh, less than three months ago. Um, the rationale for this is that patients may have sterile inflammation, which can lead to a false positive scan. Um, interestingly, at the time of this recommendation, um, 
this uh, this was based on essentially expert opinion and a few case reports. Um, but since then, there have been a number of studies suggesting that there's actually no significant difference in FDG uptake before or after three months postoperatively. And so um, really, there isn't great evidence that false positives are more likely. Um, so, you know, PET should not necessarily be avoided in these patients if it is otherwise indicated. And furthermore, waiting uh, the more than three months to repeat an FDG PET uh, in the case of a false positive is unlikely to be a benefit because it's unlikely to change. So in summary, um, PET provides complementary information when combined with ECHO. Um, it's more accurate for sure in prosthetic valve endocarditis and really shouldn't be used in native valve endocarditis um, unless you're looking at complications of endocarditis. Um, the presence and degree of FDG uptake correlates with adverse outcomes, including the risk of embolization. And also be aware when ordering this test um, or interpreting this test of false negatives in patients with low levels of systemic inflammation, particularly those who have completed antibiotic therapy, as well as false positives in patients uh, with prior use of surgical adhesives. So it's always important to review the operative note or talk to the surgeon um, to, to understand what was done. Uh, so while on the topic of nuclear cardiology, I, I wanted to quickly mention the utility of leukocyte scintigraphy or the WBC scan in endocarditis. Um, it's shown a lot of promise in, in this uh, setting. Um, it's sometimes used when the results of FDG PET may be equivocal, such as with prior bioglue use. Um, so this is an example of a case where a young woman had a mass on a recently implanted uh, bioprosthetic uh, mitral valve um, and the mass uh, was correlated with increased uptake on the WBC scan. I presume they, the authors did it um, because of the recent implantation and a fear of a falsely positive scan on the, the FDG PET. Um, the main drawback to this imaging modality, um, which is you know the same reason why it's not um, done as often, is that it's far more labor intensive, requires taking a sample of the patient's blood, radio labeling, um, WBCs and then injecting it back to the patient within a pretty short time period. Um, and then um, because the diagnosis requires demonstration of time dependent increase in uptake, um, it requires potentially successive imaging um, over the course of 24 hours. Looking at the same meta-analysis uh, from our center, uh, leukocyte scintigraphy performs very well um, although there is uh, relatively less data on this modality. Um, so there's an even higher accuracy um, in WPC scans uh, compared to an FDG PET. Um, so overall, um, this makes sense um, as uh, WPC scintigraphy targets infection as opposed to glucose metabolism um, as seen um, with inflammation as well, uh, which you get with FDG PET. All right, so we'll now switch gears entirely and talk about um, the second topic. So probably one of the most frustrating and challenging topics in endocarditis, um, but nevertheless very important and pertinent. Um, so patients who inject drugs. Um, it's hard to talk about this population without first um, talking about the opioid epidemic that's been ongoing for three decades. Um, so really this epidemic started in the early 1990s, um, which was sort of the first wave initiated by increased prescription of opioids. Um, this was followed by a second wave in 2010 involving heroin and then a third wave involving synthetic fentanyl or illicitly manufactured fentanyl. Um, of course, um, intravenous drug use associated endocarditis um, is not a new entity, but it's become a lot more prevalent um, and worse since the onset of the opioid epidemic, um, especially in younger patients who may not necessarily know how to um, inject safely and in a clean way. 
Um, so this is Ontario data. Um, it's from an epidemiological study that showed that the number of patients admitted with endocarditis who use IV drugs um, has steadily uh, increased over time. A recent paper published by in JAK by a group uh, out of Spain describes the characteristics of this population on a global scale. Um, they presented data from the International Collaboration on Endocarditis, which consists of uh, 64 sites from 24, 28 countries, um, and they've collected prospective data on over 7,000 patients with endocarditis since 1999. Um, they found that patients with um, inject injection drug use associated endocarditis uh, tended to be a lot younger with a mean age of 37. Um, they're, uh, they're predominantly male and their comorbidities um, were quite different from uh, patients without drug use. Um, so they included a lot more patients with HIV as well as liver disease. Uh, compared with uh, non-IDU patients who present, um, you know, with uh, past history of heart failure, diabetes, or CKD. Um, these patients were twice as likely to have prior endocarditis. Um, most, mostly their native valves were infected. Um, and of course, um, you know, they had a higher proportion of uh, right-sided endocarditis. Um, although left-sided endocarditis occurred in about half of them as well. Uh, by far the most common infecting organism was Staph aureus. Um, compared to uh, more of a variety of causes in non-IDU associated endocarditis, although Staph aureus um, is still uh, sort of the lead causative organism in, in that group as well. Um, I found the surprising in, in that uh, the, the uh, prevalence of stroke was actually quite similar in um, IV drug use associated endocarditis um, uh, and the risk of systemic emboli, non-stroke systemic emboli was higher, um, mostly due to an increased uh, prevalence of pulmonary emboli. Um, heart failure was less common in this population but um, they also tended to have more persistent bacteremia. So there are a multitude of factors that make the management of these patients very challenging, as we've all seen. Um, so first of all is deciding if and when to do surgery. Um, also the role of outpatient parenteral antibiotic therapy, essentially sending patients home with an indwelling catheter. Um, of course, their underlying substance use disorder is in itself very, very challenging to treat. And then associated with that, um, these patients are often stigmatized and, and so, you know, they're, they often leave against medical advice. Um, they are faced with many psychosocial challenges, including homelessness and psychiatric comorbidities, and they are at very high risk of valve reinfection. And so the decision to uh, for redo surgery sometimes becomes very important. Um, a large study of um, IDU associated endocarditis uh, from the United States has examined the clinical outcomes of these patients. Um, so they compared the odds of uh, mortality relative to non-IDU endocarditis, as well as um, compared uh, patients who underwent surgery uh, here in Orange uh, compared to those who didn't. Um, essentially, they found that uh, while the adjusted odds of mortality was lower in the IDU group, um, there were no differences in mortality or readmissions before or after 30 days um, between patients who um, had surgery and patients who did not have surgery. Um, so the evidence is very conflicting for mortality benefit in early surgery uh, for right-sided endocarditis. And so the AHA guidelines um, list uh, only class 2A recommendations uh, for um, severe tricuspid regurgitation with heart failure and poor response to medical therapy, uh, sustained infection from fastidious organisms or vegetation uh, size greater or equal to 20 millimeters rec with recurrent septic pulmonary emboli. Um, of course, this is 
um, uh, balance with the risk um, uh, of untreated underlying addiction and ongoing IV drug use. And there is a very high uh, recidivism rate in this population with um, about 70% um, who continue to inject drugs after their first operation and 44% after their second operation. Um, and uh, along with the morbidity and mortality of their addiction um, itself, um, in endocarditis specifically, reinfection of prosthetic valve and material um, represents a cause of uh, uh, morbidity and mortality in these patients as well. Um, so there are both surgical and medical strategies to mitigate these risks. Um, for example, valvectomy or a resection of the entire tricuspid valve without replacing it was um, used to be more commonly done. Um, but now, because of concerns for progressive artery failure, most have abandoned this approach. Um, another surgical approach has been to sacrifice um, more residual TR for implanting less prosthetic material. Um, um, and of course, aggressive management of the substance use disorder. Uh, including consideration of inpatient rehabilitation is paramount. Uh, a survey of 94 Canadian surgeons published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery highlights the large variation um, in when surgery is even offered. Um, about half of surgeons in Canada would offer only uh, one operation. Um, whereas about a third would uh, offer up to one reoperation. Um, sp specifically considering prosthetic valve endocarditis in these patients, um, surgeons were pretty evenly split um, uh, about whether or not they would operate. Um, some, um, actually most surgeons would not if the endocarditis uh, episode was directly related to uh, IV drug use. Um, but, you know, there's a, a widespread of what uh, surgeons would do. Some, some uh, would operate, um, some would discuss with a heart team, some would not at all. And then others would take um, uh, cases uh, on a case by case basis. Uh, a tremendous logistical challenge in these patients is also how to administer long-term antibiotic therapy, which is the cornerstone of management in endocarditis. Um, in the general population, um, outpatient parenteral antibiotic therapy, or OPAT, um, has been shown to improve treatment success uh, in a cost-effective manner. Uh, but of course, in the IDU population, there um, are significant uh, concerns with um, uh, the risk of tampering and injection of illicit drugs through the indwelling catheter or patients who are lost to follow up within the legal ramifications of what to do with a medical device, you know, in these patients that may be misused. Um, so in their comprehensive guideline statement on OPAT, uh, the IDSA provides really no strong recommendation about whether uh, patients um, who use IV drugs may be treated with OPAT at home, and they cite a small observational study um, that uh, says that uh, this suggests that IDU increases the risk of vascular complications. However, they do acknowledge that there has been ex um, some published experience with good uh, treatment outcomes. In a review of the literature from the same year, the authors of this study found that 10 studies, uh, mostly from the US and Canada, show excellent treatment completion rates in patients who inject drugs. Um, the incidence of adverse PIC events was low um, at around 3 to 9%. Um, however, there was greater use of after hour nursing calls, more frequent non compliance events, um, but did, this did not result in any difference in readmissions. There are tools. Um, that have been used to help clinicians guide this kind of decision making. Um, this is one example uh, from a group uh, from the University of Alabama. They were able to develop a nine point score, um, which included things like cravings, unstable home environment, um, uh, dual psychiatric diagnosis. Um, and the more points you had, the higher risks you, risk you were. Um, and so they would only discharge patients with OPAT if they had low risk, so score less than uh, less than four. 
Um, they found that this reduced the mean length of stay by 20 days, reduced total cost, as well as increased the capacity for additional patients in their center. Um, so whether the treatment is primarily medical or surgical, clearly the common link to these patients is that uh, um, you know, they uh, are at high risk for mortality and morbidity so long as they are actively injecting drugs. Uh, addiction is a very complex disease uh, manifested by compulsive behavior, dependence, withdrawal, as well as functional impairment. Um, and so addiction specialists and other experts um, are able to provide um, the multifaceted support um, that's necessary in these patients, um, which includes one or more of um, uh, opioid agonist therapy, uh, mental and social uh, support, as well as um, sort of liaising with drug rehabilitation programs. Um, uh, in addition to that, um, there have been other um, uh, strategies that have shown benefit in this patient population, um, which are essentially harm reduction strategies such as intravenous opioid agonist therapy, um, which is particularly effective in um, severe or refractory cases of ongoing uh, substance use. Um, so with that said, most of us have recognized firsthand how challenging these patients are, uh, not only to diagnose, but to manage. Uh, no two endocarditis patients are the same. Uh, furthermore, it's not really a disease we see very commonly. Um, so it, it makes sense to coordinate care through a multidisciplinary endocarditis team that can offer expertise specifically um, at each stage of the management pathway. Um, so our main goal of the endocarditis team is to help the MRP and primary treating team um, because of how complex these patients are. Um, and we're able to, um, because of uh, the sort of team-based approach, we're able to encompass several fields that really no one person can be a, a complete expert in. There have been studies mostly out of Europe um, that have evaluated the effect of having a formalized endocarditis team. Uh, in Canada, the only published evidence uh, is from a, a center, uh, is from Sunnybrook in Toronto, um, but I'm sure there are other centers who have um, endocarditis teams as well. At the end of the day, uh, the implementation of some of these teams actually led to a reduction in mortality. Um, these teams tended to be more fully protocolized, um, tended to have includes uh, systematic consultations as a part of their uh, protocol and were fully compliant with antimicrobial and surgical guidelines. Um, they met regularly and had systematic follow-up after patient discharge. So um, this is sort of the spectrum of, there's a lot of variation in how endocrine teams are run, um, but in general, the more rigorous you are um, about your approach, the better your outcomes. So it was based on this premise that um, we established a team of our own back in July 2020. Initially, it just it consisted of only a handful of us, um, but since then it has quickly grown and is now attended by 20 or 30 specialists every meeting, um, encompassing nine or 10 different subspecialties. Um, so it's uh, become quite uh, amazing to be a part of. Um, I think Dr. Rubens had said yesterday during um, one of the meetings that uh, it's very uncommon to see this sort of participation from um, such a wide variety of subspecialties in one meeting. Um, and I think, you know, it's been partly facilitated by how easy it is to do, uh, to have meetings virtually now. Um, referrals are generally from the MRP or they come from the subspecialists who are involved in the care of these patients. The discussions happen every week for an hour. Um, we discuss all active cases as well as, well as follow-ups. And the MRP is always invited to provide um, the clinical context and to follow up on um, the recommendations that are made. 
Um, so that we found um, is very important. Um, our recommendations generally are to um, pursue additional imaging or investigations when warranted. Um, um, we also make changes or recommendations to change medical or surgical management and essentially this facilitates an automatic referral to cardiac surgery if it's appropriate. Um, doc we document our findings or, and our recommendations in the chart. Um, however, it's important to note that we doesn't replace um, the recommendations that are given by uh, a formal consultation on the patient. Um, we also try to facilitate follow up with both cardiac surgery and ID as well as with cardiology um, for medically managed patients. So who should be referred to the, the team? I would say that all patients with definite endocarditis, regardless of complexity, should be referred, um, as well as selected patients with possible endocarditis um, with a high suspicion as well. Um, and um, I would say that uh, patients should be referred immediately um, uh, we, we routinely meet every Tuesday, however, we are set up to review patients ad hoc um, in emergency settings. Um, so just going through some of the, the data from um, the inception of our team, we uh, to date we have discussed 53 unique cases. Of course, the number of um, Cases in total we've discussed is much more than that um, because we uh, um, we do review um, the same cases every week uh, sometimes. Um, most of our referral sites um, uh, or uh, patients are referred from uh, the civic as well as the general um, and they come mostly from cardiology or medicine or medicine subspecialties but we do get occasional referrals from within and outside of Ottawa and even outside of Ontario. Um, out of those 53 patients about three quarters um, uh, have uh, infective endocarditis so uh, uh, an endocardial infection um, a handful have LVAD infections and CID infections um, and then a lot of them we uh, find to have endocarditis that uh, is either not active or sort of mimics of endocarditis. Um, out of the 39 cases um, with endocarditis, um, we found that about a third are female and about two thirds are male. Average age is 59. And about 15% um, have injection drug use. Um, in terms of the valve in, valves involved, um, most are left-sided endocarditis. Um, uh, very few are multi-valve and about one-fifth um, include prosthetic valve endocarditis. This is the um, microbiologic distribution. As you can see, most cases are either MSSA um, or coagulase negative staph. Um, but then we have a pretty good distribution of, of other um, infecting organisms as well. Um, in terms of the decisions made, about half are um, recommended to have uh, medical therapy and about half are uh, recommended to have urgent surgery. Um, the, the reasons for surgery are listed here and most patients uh, go for surgery due to valvular heart failure or having abscesses or other destructive lesions. Um, so some outcomes of our team have uh, been shown here. Uh, so compared to the one year before inception of the team, um, we've actually increased the proportion of patients who end up having consultation with cardiac surgery. Um, only about half of those patients, as I said, end up um, having a plan for surgery. However, all of those patients who have, you know, uh, have been decided to have surgical management end up undergoing surgery. Um, I think this is because fewer patients end up sort of deteriorating or on temporizing medical therapy prior to their surgery. Um, you can see that the consult time from consultation to surgery is numerically lower um, um, after inception of our team. Um, and um, uh, that's including patients who um, 
we've decided should have surgery at the first endocarditis team meeting. Um, so some ongoing kind of goals and trajectories of this group um, include ongoing quality of improvement and creating a hospital-wide database for these patients. Um, we also are looking to standardize EPIC order sets um, uh, as well as provide informational pamphlets and wallet cards for patients. So both of these are in the works right now. Um, we've also uh, been talking about creating um, national guidelines. Um, uh, the surgical group here is uh, looking at uh, specifically um, dental recommendations uh, prior to cardiac surgery. And then uh, we actually just had a meeting yesterday uh, talking about um, uh, organizing a conference, in endo a nationwide conference in endocarditis that uh, will be interdisciplinary. Um, so these are some things to look out for in the next year or so. Um, so in conclusion, I wanted to advocate um, for the endocarditis team as a way to hopefully decrease mortality in a population where mortality is exceedingly high. Um, it's an effective tool that we can use to systematically apply diagnostic and therapeutic protocols, um, which are paramount in achieving a mortality benefit in this population. Um, and our goal um, is to have the Ottawa Hospital and the Heart Institute become a, an expert center, a regional referral center for endocarditis, which I am confident we are, are, we are equipped to do. Um, so, um, in order to facilitate this, um, we want to have all cases of endocarditis referred as soon as possible for discussion. And again, we're able to have impromptu meetings um, if need be. Um, lastly, I'd just like to acknowledge the tremendous effort and enthusiasm of um, really everyone on the endocarditis team. Um, but including Dr. Masika Zaytoun, Dr. Fraser Rubens, and Dr. Francois Claire, um, whose collective wisdom I've learned so much from over the past several months as being part of the team. Um, also, my, um, my thanks, um, tremendous thanks to Amy Charlebois, who has done a spectacular job of taking over my role as the coordinator of this team. Um, so everyone's dedication is, is very much appreciated. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Um, thank you for your time and attention. Um, so now I'd like to take any questions or hear any comments you might have. Um, and I think Dr. Masika, Zaytoun, and Dr. Rubens are on the line as well, so they can help moderate. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, that was excellent. Um, I was wondering, could you comment on um, in EPIC, how do we um, make these referrals? Is there a, a specific referral to the program? Um, yeah, for now. So there is one of two ways. Um, probably the easiest way is to contact Amy Charlebois directly. Um, so I have her email here. Um, um, the other way is to actually um, put in the order in EPIC as endocarditis team rounds, um, and it should pop up um, whether the patient is an inpatient or an outpatient. Um, if there are any difficulties, because I know sometimes it's not the most straightforward, um, feel free to message me or Amy about that. Okay, um, and then there's a, a comment um, in the section from, uh, from uh, Dr. Bromley. Um, she just wanted everyone to know that um, at TOH, the substance use program team is available uh, to assist with um, the treatment for these individuals, um, and that ideally uh, substance use treatment would be optimized for all these folks. Um, but unfortunately, um, the community resources are quite limited at this time. Um, I'm not sure. I think uh, Dr. Uh, Masika Zatun is, is on uh, of the uh, discussion panel this morning. David, do you have any comments you'd like to make at this time? Uh, thanks, Eddie. Uh, first, I would like to congratulate uh, Lawrence for his uh, fantastic presentation. It, uh, Lawrence has been instrumental in the setup of the team. I don't think we could have done it without him. Uh, he was uh, the push-up uh, to start when we did that in July. Uh, so I would like to 
thank him again a lot. Um, they are very complex patients. So uh, again, as uh, Lawrence mentioned, we are here to help to provide recommendation. Uh, MRP will decide what he wants to do, but uh, the team is here to help a clinician to uh, manage these very complex patients. I don't know if we have uh, other questions. Um, Lawrence, is there any role for um, these patients uh, who use intravenous drugs to come back on a daily basis for their IV antibiotics, you know, to a day unit or something like that, um, as opposed to leaving them with an indwelling catheter? I know you, you did mention some um, data on, on looking at this population with and discharging them home with these PICC lines. Um. Yeah, actually, um, so I'm not sure exactly if that's been a, an approach um, in that population. Um, I know, or it's, I don't think it's been looked at uh, in a rigorous way either. Um, I know in some other patients, I've seen them come back daily for their antibiotics um, in that way. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, I think um, if a patient who uses IV drugs is to go home on OPAT, um, they are getting very uh, routine and rigorous follow-up, whether or not that's them coming back into hospital or if it's a, an outreach nurse visiting them on a very regular basis. Um, so they're, you know, they definitely have very good follow-up regardless of how that's implemented. Yeah, and I suppose vascular access may be challenging in some of these folks, depending upon what their, their veins are. Uh, look like. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you very much, Lawrence. That was excellent. Um, I think a lot of people actually didn't even know that um, this team existed uh, for referrals, so this was great um, uh, to uh, educate the uh, division regarding uh, uh, this opportunity to refer these patients to, uh, to the team, so good luck with the, the project going forward. Um, Thank you everyone for joining this morning. Uh, just a couple announcements. Um, one, Cecilia Donnelly is retiring this week and she's been instrumental in helping to organize these rounds. So um, on behalf of the division, we would like to thank her for her support um, and uh, wish her well during her uh, retirement. Um, da, um, uh, Hala Shasaid will be um, taking over for Cecilia. So you'll be receiving emails uh, from her going forward um, regarding rounds. Uh, next week is a ground rounds presentation. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, from uh, the chief of the uh, mental health program, uh, Dr. Jess uh, Fedorowicz at uh, TOH. He's going to be discussing um, mood disorders and cardiovascular risk. So please uh, join for that session. Um, because it is a grand rounds, it will be a Zoom meeting. Um, and the uh, invite to enroll was sent out earlier this week. Um, so have a good week, everybody, uh, and we'll see you next week for Grand Rounds, moderated by Dr. Liu. Thanks so much, Lawrence.